Do you know that there is only one God in three eternal persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Do you know that Jesus said he is the only way to heaven, and his death and resurrection bring forgiveness of sins to all who believe? Welcome to the Pastor Study, a ministry of pastorstudy.org. Join us now as we study God's Word, the Bible, together. Welcome to the Pastor Study. If somebody asked you, what is mankind's biggest problem? What would you say? Or another way to ask it, what is your biggest problem? You get, what's my health? Or my finances? Or I'm in a rough marriage? Or my children are messed up? But whether you know it or not, that's not your biggest problem. Your biggest problem is the wrath of God. That is, that God is holy, and I am sinful, and I am in trouble with God. That is your biggest problem. And isn't it strange, we live in a day and age when most people don't even think about the wrath of God. When you went to church in Europe in the Middle Ages, and still there are these thousand-year-old cathedrals all over Italy and Spain and, and England, you walk into church, and over the door of a lot of them is a big sculpture of the Last Judgment. Jesus sitting on his throne, judging the world. The dead are being raised. The saved are being pulled up into heaven. The damned are being pulled down into hell. And you saw that every Sunday when you went to church. You thought about the wrath of God in medieval Europe. So our, our, pr our program today is, how can I be saved from my biggest problem, which is the eternal wrath of God. You know, I was raised in the church. I've believed Jesus died for my sins my whole life, but I didn't understand what that meant and why he had to die until I was 20 years old sitting in a class on Paul's letter to the Romans and the atonement was explained. So would you do this? Let's, would you get out your Bible, turn to Romans chapter 5, and let's pray. Father, we pray for everyone watching this program that they will be concerned about their biggest concern, where they're going to spend all eternity. And Lord, speak to us on how we sinners can be put right with a holy God. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Paul the Apostle writes the book of Romans, Romans chapter 5, and we start at verse 6. For while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Here's the first lesson today. We are weak and cannot save ourselves. That verse says we are helpless. So here's a man drowning in the ocean. And his wife runs up to the lifeguard and said, Save my husband. You see him flailing out there? Oh, yes, I'll save him. And he stood there. No, I said, okay, so, so go save my husband. He, yes, madam, I will. And he just stood there. Finally, the guy starts going under. The lifeguard swims out, picks the man up, and brings him safely to the shore. And he was fine, but the wife was mad. Why didn't you go out and rescue him when I told you to? Well, ma'am, I've been a lifeguard a long time now. I have learned if I try to save him while he's trying to save himself, we both go down. But if I wait till he gives up, that's when I can save him. Are you trying to save yourself and I'm going to be good enough and I'm going to try real hard and I'm going to earn my way into heaven? You'll never be saved until you give up and say, Lord, I'm a sinner. I'm helpless. I need Jesus to save me. Look at the rest of verse 6, Romans 5, verse 6. At the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Here's the next lesson. We are ungodly. Now you might say, well, but pastor, that's so negative. I, I want to feel good about me. I want to have a good positive self-image. And, and in fact, my New Age books tell me that I am God. I'm wonderful. So don't tell me I'm ungodly. Listen, until you understand that you are an ungodly sinner, Jesus and the cross will make no sense to you. Next verse, verse 7. 
For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for a good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And here's the next lesson. God's love is extravagant. I mean, you might die for somebody who's a good person. God dies for people who are wicked persons. <laughs> God's love is extravagant. So this week, a woman says, you know, Pastor Brock, I'm feeling very sinful about myself, and I've been a bad mother, and I feel, I feel so wicked. Do you have a verse that tells me that God still loves me anyway? And I pointed to this verse. God shows his love for us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I also pointed to 1 Timothy chapter 1, where the Apostle Paul, no less, says, It is a sure saying that Christ came into the world to save sinners, of whom I'm the worst. And I pointed her to 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And I said to her, what you need to do is ask God's forgiveness, forgive yourself, and move on. Because... Satan loves it when we beat ourselves up for our sins. Don't do that. Receive God's forgiveness, forgive yourself, and move on. God's love is extravagant. Uh, look at verse 9. Much more than having now been justified by his blood. Let me stop here. The word justified, let me define it. It's a legal term that came from the Roman law courts. It means to be declared righteous. Now, Paul was an ancient Roman, and he, again, he takes this analogy from the court system, and here's what Paul is saying. You walk into the courtroom. You're standing before the judge. You are guilty of your sins, but God declares you righteous. He declares you not guilty of your sins. Now, how can I, a guilty sinner, be declared not guilty of my sins? That's the next part of the verse. We are justified, verse 6, Verse 7, uh, verse 8, I'm sorry, and 9. We are justified by his blood. The word blood there is a reference to Christ's sacrificial death. The blood in the New Testament refers to Christ's sacrificial death. In the Old Testament, if I was a Jew and sinned, I'd take the lamb to the temple, the priest would kill the lamb, and I'd be forgiven. This is why we call Jesus the Lamb of God. He's killed. He takes my punishment so I can be forgiven. There's a story about a European cathedral. And many years ago, they're building it. And the man, the workman on the top slips over and falls off the roof. And everybody's sure he's dead because it's a very tall cathedral. But they get to the bottom of the, of the cathedral. And the man is dazed, but he gets up and he's fine. Because a shepherd was driving a flock of sheep in front of him, just at the moment the man fell from the sky, the man crushed a lamb to death. But the man himself was saved and fine. In fact, uh, instead of putting a cross on the top of this cathedral, there's a, there's a statue of a lamb uh, to remind them of how this thing was built. Well, that's the way a sinner can be made right, declared not guilty, justified in the sight of God, is because of what Jesus did on the cross. Look at verse 9. Having been justified or put right with God, declared not guilty by Christ's blood, his death, we will be saved from the wrath of God through him. I want you to notice the tense of the verse in verse 9. It's future. And there's the next point. Salvation and wrath are future. I mean, there's a present tense, wrath of God. There is a... Um, Anytime somebody's thrown in jail for stealing or you get herpes because you've been fornicating or, you know, fill in the blank, there's a present tense, wrath of God. But in the future wrath of God is hell, and that's what Jesus saves us from. So not only is the, the wrath of God a future thing that's going to happen, our salvation, that's where that totally happens. So I want to explain now um, salvation past, present, and future. This will help you. Please see if you can follow this. Let's talk about my salvation past. I was saved. 
That's referring to my justification when God declared me not guilty of all my sins because of Christ and I was saved from sin's penalty. That's done. Present tense, I am being saved from sin's power. This is called sanctification, which means the process by which the Holy Spirit cleans me up. I have good days, I have bad days, but I'm being now saved from sin's power. And then one day at the second coming, it's called glorification, when Christ returns in the clouds and raises the dead and takes us to heaven, I'll be saved from sin's presence. I won't even be around sin anymore. So do you follow that? I was saved. That's referring to justification. I'm saved from sin's penalty hell. I present tense am being saved from sin's power. That's the Holy Spirit's sanctification. And one day I will be saved from the very presence of sin when Jesus returns and I will be glorified. Hope you got that. <laughs> Look at verse 10. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. The word reconciled there means two enemies become friends. It, we used to be like this. God was here and we were here and we were loggerheads. Christ's death reconciles us. And Jesus says in John chapter 15, no longer do I call you servants, I call you friends. So now God and man are friends because of the cross. Now, there are some scholars <coughs> who believe that only mankind needs to be reconciled. God doesn't need to be reconciled to us because he's always nice. We have to be reconciled to him. No, both God and man are reconciled at the cross because God has two aspects to his personality. God is loving and merciful and kind, but he's also holy and righteous. God's love wants to save us, but God's holiness, righteousness, demands that sins be punished. So how does God reconcile his love and his holiness? It's through the cross of Christ. In Palmyra, Missouri, there's a graveyard. On October 17, 1862, during the Civil War, an informer escaped town. So the commander in charge ordered that 10 of the prisoners be taken out of the jail and killed in his place because of, of the escape. One of the ten was a man by the name of William, hum William Humphrey. He was a man with, with a wife and children. There was a single man by the name of Hiram Smith, and he said, I'm a single man. Better for me to die than for a man with a family. I will be his substitute. And if you go to um, Mount Pleasant Cemetery, there's a gravestone. This monument is dedicated to the memory of Hiram Smith, the hero that sleeps beneath this sod, who was shot at Palmyra, October 17, 1862, as a substitute for my father, William Humphrey. How can God, a holy, righteous God, forgive me? It's because we have a substitute. Jesus Christ took upon himself, he had no sins of his own, he was perfect, so he could take our sinful punishment to reconcile us to God. And then look at verse 11. And not only this, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. The result of our salvation is we result in God. I remember taking a bunch of teenagers to Bible camp and I explained to them that we can know our sins are forgiven. We can know we're going to heaven because it doesn't depend on me. It depends 100% on Christ. And I don't see this very often, but I saw these teenagers rejoice like, you're kidding. <laughs> and and it, was, it was interesting. I remember an old preacher saying once, if your salvation in Christ doesn't periodically make you want to jump up and down and shout, something's wrong. <laughs> because our salvation, our reconciliation, causes us, us to rejoice in God. 
Well, let me close the sermon now, but there are four kinds of people watching this TV program right now. See if you can discern which you are. Person number one, you're not sure you're saved, but you should be because you are sorry for your sins. You do trust in Christ as your Savior. So this person isn't sure they're saved, but they should be. Person number two, this person isn't sure they're saved, and they shouldn't be, because they've never repented of sin, they've never truly put their trust in Christ alone to save them, so they're not sure they're saved, and they shouldn't be. Person number three, and this is the scary one, this person is sure they're saved, and they're not saved. (laughs) They shouldn't be. I mean, listen, just because you have a vague belief that God exists, The devil believes God exists. And person number three has never turned their life and their trust over to Christ for their salvation. And person number four is sure they're saved. And they should be, because they are. They're trusting in Christ. They battle sin. They don't always win, but they repent when they lose. and, And they're following Christ, trusting him alone. So which of those four people are you? Number one, are you not sure you're saved, but you should be? Are you not sure you're saved? And you shouldn't be. Are you sure you're saved, but you shouldn't be because you're never trusting Christ and following him? And number four, are you sure you're saved and you should be because you do know Christ? Well, let me close now. What's your biggest problem? Whether you know it or not, there's something called the wrath of God coming. Hell. How can I be saved? How can I as a sinner be saved from the righteous wrath of God And here's the answer. I sang this at mom's funeral. Here's how God has solved our problem. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best For a world of lost sinners was slain. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it some day for a crown. Now here's how you're saved. Here's the solution to our problem. On that old rugged cross, stained with blood so divine, a wondrous beauty I see. For twas on that old cross, Jesus suffered and died, to pardon and sanctify me. Our problem is the wrath of God. Jesus has solved that problem by the old rugged cross. I hope you cling to him for your salvation. Amen. Welcome to the portion of the pastor study where we ask Pastor Brock questions regarding the Bible. Pastor Brock, our first letter from a viewer says, Please pray for my granddaughter. She is transitioning to the opposite sex. And I did pray for her, and I would ask our viewers to pray for this. I mean, Mona, I I got a little angry, and I thought, who's telling this granddaughter that she's really a grandson? Mm -hmm. Is that some liberal teacher or a school board, or is it Minnesota Children's Hospital that's promoting this kind of nonsense? But you know who, I hope it's not her pastor. Mm You know, I was an ELCA Lutheran, so were you. The ELCA Lutherans have the world, had the world's first transgender pastor. And I'm just, you know, I, many years ago when I was still in the ELCA, I had a difficult talk with the bishop, who was very liberal. And I shared with him my personal struggle with same-sex attraction. You know what his response was? Mm-hmm. Basically, Tom, you need to embrace this. Mm-hmm. And I can introduce you to some gay people. And I knew my Bible well enough to know that's an evil bishop. Now he's dead and only the Lord knows where he's spending eternity. But it's just tragic. You've got churches embracing this stuff. So pray for that poor granddaughter. And uh, there you go.
You know, uh, one more thing. I attended <laughs> Luther Theological Seminary in the ELCA when I graduated years ago. It was moderately liberal back then. Mm -hmm. Today it's wacko liberal. They've just hired a queer theologian mm -hmm. who's written a book on stress trauma, queer stress trauma, and the beauty of uh, uh, of queer faith, something like that. Mm -hmm. I watched his lecture. I mean, Mona, if you believe like I, you and I do, that homosexual behavior is wrong, then you're an oppressor and you're wounding mm -hmm. the LGBT community. Well, wait a minute. If 1 Corinthians 6 is true mm -hmm. and homosexuals will not inherit the kingdom of God, they're doing the wounding, not us. They're hurting people for eternity. Mm -hmm. So isn't this a strange day in which we live? It is. Ah, there it you go. is. Here's another letter from a viewer. I want to know where in the Bible it says Christ descended into hell and the third day arose from the dead and ascended into heaven. Please explain this to me. Well, that sounds like the Apostles' Creed, but the uh, so she's kind of quoting that. But mm -hmm. where does it say in the Bible that Jesus descended into hell? That would be First Peter chapter three. And I did write her, and I encouraged her get an ESV study Bible. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 3 and look at the bottom of the page for the study notes. There are three very different ways that Christians throughout the years have interpreted those words in 1 Peter 3 about Jesus going and preaching to the spirits in prison. I personally believe that after Christ died, he did go and he preached to these spirits in prison that died during Noah's flood. Uh, doesn't say he gave them a second chance, mm -hmm. just says he preached to them. So that's what I think is going on, but uh, you gotta, you gotta, that's why it's good to have an ESV study Bible. I won't go into the other two explanations, but that's where we get Jesus descended to the dead or the, or the hell, to hell. Okay. It's not, it, we, Jesus did not go to hell to pay for our sins. He already did that on the cross. It is finished. Mm -hmm. He went to hell to make proclamation is what it says, proclaiming his victory. All right. Next question. I always enjoy your show. However, you stated in a question about women can't preach to men. Are you saying, according to Ephesians, that women aren't or can't be called in the fivefold as pastors? This is not the word. Okay, so what is the fivefold? This is from Ephesians chapter 4. Uh, Paul the Apostle says this God gave some as apostles. Well, the, the apostles were men. God gave some as prophets. Well, women, some women were prophets. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, some of these evangelists, I believe women can evangelize. Some as pastors. Uh, in the New Testament, the preacher over a church is a man. Mm -hmm. First Timothy chapter 2. So uh, can women teach women? Yes. Can they teach children? Yes. Can they be evangelists? Mm -hmm. Can they be prophets? Yes. First Timothy 2 says, a woman should not preach over men or exercise authority over men. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't want to be at a church that has a female preacher. And the, the elders of the church need to be men. That's what it says, 1 Timothy 2. Mm -hmm. yeah. Go by the scripture. Yeah. If your ex-spouse cheated on you, are you free to remarry? Yeah. The question is, how do you interpret Matthew 18 and 1 Corinthians 7? If this is your situation, you're divorced and you're wondering if you're free to remarry, Read Matthew chapter 18, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. I, the, I'm going to tell you the way I understand this. I think if your spouse cheats on you, I, I think divorce is allowed. Mm -hmm. I don't think remarriage is allowed unless your prior spouse dies. Well, but what if my prior spouse got remarried to somebody new? Then I couldn't, I know, but I'd still stay single and live. This again, read 1 Corinthians 7. You can have a full life. Uh, living for the Lord as a single person. If the ex-spouse dies, I think you can re remarry. Okay. Yeah. If God already knows when we will be born and when we will die, which I believe, then why should we bother to pray for healing from an illness to save our life? Why don't we just throw up our arms and just wait and see what happens? Well, I'll, I'll say this. God not only ordains or predestines the end, mm -hmm. he predestines the means to the end. So let's say God has predestined that he's going to heal me of my cancer. Mm -hmm. Well, that doesn't mean you just sit back and do nothing because God commands us to pray. Mm -hmm. And so I pray and I do James chapter 5, I get the anointing with oil, and God heals me. Because not only does God 
uh, ordained the end. He ordains the means to the end. But you know, M Mona, I don't. I never say good luck. Mm -hmm. I believe in providence. God's mm -hmm. in control of everything. Jesus said a bird doesn't fall to, I'm, uh, to the ground apart from her father. Mm -hmm. let, me, let me give an example. Last week I went jogging. And I always pray in the morning, Lord, use me to share the gospel. So I go jogging. And I'm jogging past this liberal Methodist church across from my house. Mm -hmm. And here's a guy next door in the yard getting, taking, picking up garbage out of his lawn. And so I don't know why, because I didn't mean to. I just, I just talked to him. And it turns out he, he's, he's, he's in the church. He's helping this guy pick up his garbage. But he goes to this Methodist church. And I said, uh, are you aware of the split in the Methodist church right now over homosexuality? Oh, yes. Has your church ever thought of leaving and joining the more biblical branch of, of Methodism? Didn't sound like he did. But I was able to say, well, tonight in Minneapolis TV at 1030, the whole show is on the split in the Methodist church. Now, Mona, what are the chances of that? That that very night was the one show we did on Methodism. Wow. All right, so I'm jogging and I get down with my, and I'm jogging back home and I'm dry, and, and I'm here, the, the, Pastor Tom Brock. <laughs> and this guy turns his car around, pulls up to me. Here's a man I knew 20 years ago from, Niger from Liberia. He came and he was at my church. And then he left and I never knew what happened to him and he moved back to Liberia. But here he is, I thought that was you, etc. And, and I was able to encourage him to go to a good church because I'm not sure he is, but I gave him the name of some good churches. What's the chances of that? I mean, providence is, is real. I'm not saying stuff like that happens every day to me, but it does happen. It does. So, we, so we need to pray in the morning, God, be in control mm -hmm. of my day, and then be open to whatever pops up as the will of God. Exactly. Yeah. All right. I thought that I found a church, but in their beliefs, they said that the Holy Spirit no longer gives the gifts of tongues and healings. Should I look for another church? You said in your last show that God still does healing. There are some very conservative, I think mostly Baptist type churches that believe the supernatural gifts like speaking in tongues, miracles, prophecy stopped when the New Testament was completed because they don't think they're needed anymore because we have the Bible. That's not the way I read the Bible. I think all the gifts are still here. Mm -hmm. Would I leave a church over that? Well, I think John MacArthur is a wonderful preacher. I can sit under his preaching, but he believe, he's a cessationist, which I think is wrong. Mm -hmm. So I, you gotta pray and you'll never find a church that really matches up totally to what you believe, yes. but you, you see where the, where the lines are. There you go. Okay. Well, there we go, Mono. Everybody, thank you for watching our show and praying for us and helping us stay on the air. If you go to pastorstudy.org, you'll see all of our TV shows. You can watch them at any time and encourage people to do so. And so have a great week. Luke 137, for with God, nothing will be impossible. God bless you. See you next time on The Pastor Study. Thank you for watching The Pastor Study. You can watch more of our programs at pastorstudy.org. We are on the air preaching the good news of Jesus Christ because of the generous support of you, our viewers. Would you consider supporting our ministry? You may do so at pastorstudy.org or write the Pastor Study, P.O. Box 41294, Minneapolis, Minnesota 55441. May the blessing of our one triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you now and forever.